Well, welcome back for season three of The Full Life, and we're coming in hot with a lot to talk about. We have Lent, we have updates with all of our hosts about what's going on in their lives, and we'll talk about the situation in Ukraine, amongst much more. So why don't we just get started? Different Christian perspectives coming together to have important conversations about our faith and help you live in the fullness of life God wants for you each and every day. This is The Full Life with Joseph Mancuso, Carolyn Pankella, Hank Johnson, and Jenny Stivale. Come join the conversation. Full Life family, if you are new, welcome. If you have been with us for the last two seasons, welcome back. We're happy to have you again. We're happy to be together again. Good to see everybody here again. Hello. 2022, here we come. We're co- closing in on two years together. That's a wonderful thing. Um, and we have a lot to talk about today. First and foremost, we're going to start with our encouraging word. And today's, I believe, will come from Hank. Hey, everyone. I um, was thinking about how in this season we are getting ready for Lent. Uh, Lent is not something that I grew up practicing in my um, church tradition. It was something that's relatively new to me. Um, my introduction was Lent was, well, you just give up something. However, over the years, I found that this is a season that is practiced by not only hundreds of millions of Christians, but it's a season about more than just you know self-denial. It's a season that traditionally we believe um, kind of reminds us of Jesus's 40 days in the wilderness before he prepares for ministry. Um, So there's an aspect of marching towards ministry. But then there's also this aspect of where the calendar falls. You know, we begin Lent with Ash Wednesday, which is usually a series or a service where we focus on, you know, repentance and we focus on the fact that we will return to dust. But we also focus on the power of God's forgiveness. So we go from Ash Wednesday and then six weeks later we have Easter. Um, so this then also puts us in these 40 days or this March in the season of Lent that we're focusing on the joy to come, the celebration to come. But before the celebration, we take time to grieve. We take time to pray. We take time to, yes, maybe sacrifice and self-denial. But in all these things, we're reminded of our Jesus who prepares us not only for ministry, but life in him. And of course, the culmination of Lent is Holy Week where churches and and groups all around the world gather um, to celebrate. Uh, Some church traditions have Monday, Thursday services where they remember um, the night before, you know, then there's other churches who have Good Friday services. And of course, Easter Sunday, or in my tradition, we call it Resurrection Sunday. So I guess my encouraging word for you this week is as we prepare for this season, um, what is, you know, where do you need to maybe take a step back and say, God, where are you? Um, Where do you need to take a step back and say, God, here's where I fell short. Where do you need to take a step back and say, God, this is something I need to sacrifice, not just for my betterment, for the betterment of the kingdom. God, before I march out into the season of ministry, before I celebrate the, the goodness of the resurrection, help me to remember the sadness of Friday night, that Good Friday is only made good because your son suffered and died. So in this season of Lent, may you be encouraged to not just focus on what you give up, but how God can fill you. May you just not focus on what you deny yourself, but in what you give up so that God can fill you and use you for his glory. Amen. Yes, I was thinking as you were doing that list, it's like, where have I not let him in? That's my big thing. Where have I not, what section have I not let him in of my life? Mm-hmm. Um, Good well, word, Hank. You really ought to consider being a pe- preacher. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's you might have a prophetic gift, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Coming. <laughs> Well, since we haven't been together in a while, I thought it was a really good opportunity to just check in and see what our hosts have been up to since we've been together last. So why don't I start with Jenny? What is going on, Jenny? What's new since we've last been together? Um, It's been definitely an interesting season. We've gone through uh, a lot of pain and loss already in the season, but we've seen God's faithfulness um, uh, in our lives. We are actually, we've switched our church to, we just felt uh, in the season to be meeting outside. So we've actually gone to a from a, a brick and mortar Ooh. to an outdoor setting in a park. It's because it kind of started because COVID was so rampant in January. I mean, it was just wild. Everybody had it. And um, so we met in the park and we're kind of liking it because every week we have the opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Um, yeah. We have people, homeless people that, you know, it's a park. 
So that's just the reality. And there are people that come up every week and they'll say, is, is there any more food I can have? And so we end up, we find ourselves now we're giving away food every week. So it's been a really just natural progression. And uh, so that's been really great. We started a thing called Torah, Torah Talk Tuesdays, or as Brian, I would say, Torah Talk Tuesdays. You got to say talk like this, you know, it's like really yeah. cool. You say, the only way to say talk. You get coffee, you sit around, we talk Torah. Why not? You know? Brian and I used to read it together with the kids and we would have these great discussions. I remember I would think so often, I wish other people were in on this discussion because it's not a prepared message. It's not a, a th thought out thing. It's just us talking from that kind of well, that deep well that you have from studying the word, you know, hiding the word in your heart and something just triggers. And so we started Torah Talk Tuesdays where we sit down, we read the word, you never know what's going to come out. Um, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. We have fun together. We always have our coffee and we talk and it's about 30 minutes and uh we've really had a good time and the show's been kind of or the the yeah it's a show i guess been sort of growing so that's been a fun thing that we've been doing in the season that's the greatest thing about this is we all can be a part of what you're doing and a part yeah. of what hank's doing but what like what is the website or whatever so yeah facebook live um we go on king of kings community okay. uh los angeles that's the name of the church and then i usually yeah. share it to my page jenny St cooks to volley so yeah you can find us on facebook yeah. uh and join us and talk Grab some coffee. Yes. And there's a great website you promote all the time. It's I believe it's Hebrew yes. Hebrew for Christians. So I want to make sure. Four and okay. the yeah, the number four Christians.com. And that's a really great place to get started if you're interested. I was teaching this weekend about being grafted in, and we were always supposed to operate within the function of our Hebrew roots. And so it's yeah. a really good place to start for people's Hebrew for Christians. That's kind of where I got started learning this stuff. When the feasts come up, they give an easy breakdown and it's easy to follow along. They do like uh, table talk where they can kind of like talk about, take the portions and talk about them. How do you talk about them? So it's a good place to begin. I love that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to bring in Steve for a moment, our behind the scenes guru, because um, he's got an update as well. Hello, guru. Hey, everybody. How's it going? <laughs> of course, you remember Ray, who was adopted as of October mm -hmm. last year. Well, actually, just recently, we had a lot of family come in. And we not only got him baptized, but as you know, with COVID, it's been kind of hard for people to get their special day in court when it comes to adoptions and whatnot. So our social worker actually came to uh, the baptism and did a little bit of an adoption ceremony right there in the church for us, which was just absolutely wonderful. That was just really, really oh, special. Yeah, and, and Joseph got to be there, which was phenomenal. It was great. Yeah. It was really, really special moment. Nina, Nina was falling. Mm. Mm. Well, not you. Go. You weren't crying. No, <laughs> no, I don't do that. I'm not, I'm not a weeper. What are you talking about? No, but yeah, it was. It was really. It was super emotional, <laughs> and it was quite a blessing. Thanks for joining us, Steve. But now hey. go away. <laughs> Your job. <laughs> guy. This is looking so good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, Hank, how, what's going on, Hank? Church is doing really, really well. I think the last two, two and a half years of COVID has uh, kind of increased our creativity, um, and it's had to. Um, but some of the things we're excited about right now is we've kind of doubled down on our English as a second language. So to have a place where people can come and learn basics about English. And one of the blessings in our church is we have a lot of um, retired missionaries or people who've served in other countries. Um, so it's like we had this resource that we never tapped into. So we're really gracious for that. Um, during the pandemic, we've also been able to keep our food pantry going. So that's been a blessing to the community and also our medical clinic. We have a group that we partner with that shows up twice a month to offer free medical care. So those things are just really, really fun to see. Um, our church is growing. We're seeing new families. So that's super exciting. It's also terrifying because you're just like, what do we do with all these people? Right. So it's a good problem to have. But what we're trying to ask now is to not just have people who are sitting in the seats, you know, like what are their gifts? What are their skills? What are their abilities? And, and why has God brought them to us, right? Like, how do we do that work together? So we're super excited about that as well. So yeah, expanded our staff over the break that we had. So brought on a new pastor. So lots going on. You know, I don't know if I answered all the questions, but life is good. <laughs> but life, lots is going on. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a lot of that is so cool because, you know, you're meeting people where they are and, and they are, and, and uh, you're taking care of their most basic needs. It's, you know, you're the hands and feet, just like Jenny was saying, yeah. being in the park. And you're growing. Hey, a, a story out of COVID, you're growing. How yeah. about that? 
Yeah, uh, it's been good. It's been good. That's, that's amazing good. because, you know, the average, they're saying the average return to church rate, mm -hmm. we talked about this, I think, last time is 30 to 40%. Yeah. Is return rate. So, I mean, if you're growing, if your numbers have gone yeah. up, that's extraordinary. Well, we, we joke about how um, we're, we're not ageist around our church, but we do have this thing where we set old people and new people. And old is not an age thing. It just means pre-COVID. And we're finding that <laughs> yeah. we're finding that the 30 to 40 percent, the 30 to 40 percent might be true on the old people. That's, that's and the we're hoping, before COVID. We're hoping, yeah, yeah. We're hoping they're following us online still, right? But like a lot of the faces you see on Sunday morning are new, you know, and for a while we that's all true. had masks on. So that didn't help at all. Right. You know, so yeah. it's like people will be like, I've been here six months. I was like, oh, hi. <laughs> If you go like this, maybe I'll recognize you. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I so, yeah. walked by people. We had some people that had left. Uh, they, they moved away and they came back in town and they were visiting the church. Yeah. And they're waving at me. I'm like, <laughs> hi. And I was yeah. like, doing that sort of polite wave that you do where you mm -hmm. just try to be nice. There's some really people we knew really well, but I couldn't tell. Yeah, you can't. I just think people honestly are so hungry that I think we're going to see even more flood back. Mm. I, that's just me. I think people are going to be almost crawling to get into where there's hope. Well, Carolyn, I know you are building a community in the ministry that you've been busy with. So why don't you tell us about that in your update? Well, it's pretty cool that uh, just being with you guys, because it sort of got birth while doing this show. If you recall, it's like I just started getting involved mm -hmm. with it. I first started out thinking I was going to get involved with foster care and started going through all the process of that. And the more I got into foster care, I realized that 89% uh, of kids who are in foster care are involved in human trafficking. And I started realizing, you know, I, you know, I think we hear things on TV and we think, oh, it's somewhere, somewhere else. And then the more I started diving in, I started realizing that it's right here in America. And then I started getting the information and started realizing it is a $150 billion a year industry. And I got to say that again, because I don't think we can fathom it. $150 billion a year industry and 40.3 million globally involved in human trafficking. And uh, the thing about it is Florida, California is number one. Florida is number three. I just started realizing my spirit, you know how it is when you're called to something yeah. and then you just start going. And then it was like, people just, God just started bringing things to me and I started connecting with people. And then I got invited to go sing for the human, the national human trafficking foundation. And then I will go out to pastors and I started going places and not all of them, but a lot of people were like, they had no idea what it was. And I'm like, we've got to get this conversation started and really let people know that it is in our backyards. It can be your neighbor. That's what started the whole thing for me. And then I just started mentoring and I went back to school and got my mental health counseling coaching and then started working at places and beginning to counsel and mentor. And then um, the more I get to meet these girls and work with these girls and hear their stories, let me tell you something. Their stories will change your life because you realize the human spirit is really about survival. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, these girls and boys, they've not given up. And matter of fact, I have brought one of my dear friends on with us today that she is one of my partners. Um, we do a lot of stuff together of just bringing awareness and um, education prevention. And she is a survivor warrior herself. We don't mm -hmm. call them just survivors. They are survivor warriors herself. Mm -hmm. And so I just can't wait to share and let her share a little bit of her story with you and just uh be inspired about the grace of God and the goodness of God and the hope that we get with God. And so if I can just introduce her, this is Miss Kim. Can you come on? Hi, Hi Kim. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here and, and being willing to share your story with us um, because we do want to bring awareness. And so I do want to start there. I mean, can you uh, share your story with us about your experience with human trafficking? Yeah, sure. So I mean, it started out, um, I was a young girl and I came from a single parent home and um, I can remember as early as the age of, you know, three to five years old, um, a lot of sexual abuse started happening within the home and um, it wasn't long after that, it was physical and mental and verbal um, and that would continue on for many years. 
that ended up leading me into foster care. And so I went through foster care and we all know, just as Ms. Carolyn just shared, it's still very broken. So where I thought I was going to find hope and healing and restoration, it wasn't there and that wasn't the answer. And so I actually ended up um, becoming a teenage runaway. And as I was running away, mm -hmm. I ended up running away to a brothel, what I thought was some a place that I didn't even recognize it as a brothel at that time. I'm going to be honest with you as a kid. Um, I just thought it was a place where I was getting food and shelter and it was better than foster care. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, they were providing me all my needs. What I learned later in life, it was a brothel, though, because there was an exchange for food and shelter and all of that. And so that continued. And I just really was so, so utterly lost and hopeless and in despair that I ended up um, catching a bunch of criminal charges, to be honest with you, and then found myself wrapped up within the criminal system and going into DJJ commitment programs. And that's where I would spend the rest of my teenage years not having any normalcy at all. Um, but being there until I was about 17 years old, and then I was released back into the same streets where I had just came from, the same, the same exact environment where I just came from with no plan in place, nothing mm -hmm. different. And um, unfortunately, that led me into uh, homelessness. And so I started couch surfing and just learning how to survive and provide for myself. And um, I actually ended up having a few kiddos. Um, while, while being trafficked. Um, so let me rewind. I had, wow. Wow. yeah, so I, I had one kiddo, um, in the life and then I, I met a guy at a gas station yeah. and, um, you know, I thought he was a normal, a normal guy, right? Like, like any guy that you see that can be your neighbor, you know, it could be your brother, it could be your cousin, you guys get the point. And so, um, you know, I had no clue that he was grooming me you know, for, for sex trafficking. And, um, for three weeks, he pretended to be someone that cared about me and that he, um, loved me. And then he was, you know, taking me to get my hair done and my nails done and, you know, just taking me out and really whining and dining me. And, and here I'm thinking that, you know, this is, and this is what I've been waiting for my whole life is for somebody to love me. Um, unfortunately after three weeks of this, um, he then asked me, did I want to go on vacation? And so I said, yes. What girl wouldn't say yay? Wouldn't mm -hmm. say yes, right? I have never even been on a family vacation before. And so I said yes. And um, I did not know that it was not a vacation, that he was taking me to South Florida to my very first city to start working. And um, it was there where six brutal years came into play of being uh, sex trafficked and sold to five different pimps all across the states, which mine was a federal case um, and a life of agony. Wow. A, a lot came after that still. So <laughs> again, like I mentioned, I was in survival mode and I was feeding myself out of a gas station mm -hmm. and um, I walked out and there I locked eyes with him and it only took three words for him to know that he had his victim. And those three words were, you are beautiful. And those were three words I never heard my entire life. Um, and it probably didn't matter if I would have heard them my entire life, right? Mm -hmm. Because I was insecure. I didn't know my worth. Um, I immediately hung my head down low. And that's when he knew that I was vulnerable and I was his right victim. I mean, my exact reaction, I remember it till this day was this, and that's where he continued conversation, continued probing me, continued finding out my background. Um, it was more so within that three weeks of him learning my background of where, you know, knowing my family dynamics, knowing, you know, me feeling like I can trust him and open up, right? And tell him, you know, the truth about things. Well, it led me to that bigger, you know, vulnerability mm -hmm. of him trapping me in the life of trafficking because he then knew that no one was going to look for me. So when we arrived in South Florida, um, that's where he went in and he got a hotel key. He played it off really well. Like he went into the office. He got he acted like he was getting a hotel key that he was checking us in. He got back in the truck and he drove around to the room. And that's when we walked inside the room and his his bottom B, his bottom girl. I'm not going to say the word on here, but that's what it's referred to. Um, she was in the room. 
And I walked in that room and that's where literally my stomach just like regurgitated to my throat and I knew something was wrong. And I felt like I just couldn't even breathe because I was like, a hotel room does not come with a female already in it. But at this point, I didn't even, I didn't even know what to do. I just frantically just shut down. And that's when they began telling me that, you know, um, what this was. And she was like, you're going to go to work with me tonight and I'm going to show you how to do this. And where they, where she took me to, to work was an all new club. And so I was like, Oh my gosh, like I can't even keep a bathing suit on. Like I was freaking out, even though I had had a pretty rough life, like still up until this point to just get off and strip all your clothes off and go out there and act like it's nothing. Like I was like completely furious inside. And so I sat in this chair like this and she went and called him on me and said, um, your little new girl you found is not working. She's just sitting back here losing all your money. So you better do something about it or go get a new chick. And so um, he got on the phone and he started cursing me out and going off on me and telling me I better make his money right now or else it's going to be a night that I'll never forget. And he knew I didn't have a mother or father to come look for me. He knew I didn't have family to look for me. And so he would say things like, if I kill you tonight, no one's going to look for you tomorrow and you know it. So why are you even going to try? He knew that I didn't have stable housing. He knew that I didn't have any other source of income. He knew that no one was taking care of me. And I mean, it was just a hot mess. So they mix these truth with lies and it really gets you thinking like, oh my gosh, like he's telling the truth. Like no one is not going to look for me. And I mean, even still to this day, right? Like I'm so thankful for the support that I have around me, but the Stockholm syndrome, the brainwashing, the manipulation, the trauma bonding that comes with trafficking. That's why we can't leave. We may not be physically bound in a closet, but we're emotionally bound to the point of where we are crippled and we can't get up and walk away. So homelessness, the LGBTQ plus community, um, you know, uh, just any type of vulnerability that can truly leave mm -hmm. you in a place of where you need somebody to supply that basic necessity of life. If you have those basic necessities missing or even, you know, knowing your worth and having that right. love and attention and affection. Or like you said, you know, it's, it's, it's a big vulnerability that leads us into that place. How have you been healed and how are you restored? You know, uh, you know, I know that's a, a process of many steps, but can you talk, uh, tell, talk us through that process a little bit? Yeah. So it's a lot of hard work. And if mm -hmm. I'm being completely honest with you, every day is still a journey. A domestic violence went down. It was a really, really, really bad situation to the point of where cops were called out and everything. And um, I was actually super blessed with that cop writing Grace Family Church. I went to the domestic violence shelter and after I got out of the hospital and I turned that, that card over on the back that said Grace Family Church. And I was like, I've got nothing else to lose. And right. so, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. I'd love to sit here and say, oh, yeah, I had a program and, you know, I did this and I did that. But no, I didn't. I had to make the choice every day to want to get better. And so I took the courage to walk into that church completely broken. And there was somebody in that church and she was the elder of the church. And it wasn't just that first time. She watched me over a period of time. Um, but she was very gentle and graceful about it. Um, I would walk in completely broken with a hoodie over my head and I wouldn't talk to anybody. And I'd go sit at the very top tier and just want to be alone. And um, she knew the signs of human trafficking because she was in an awareness and education. Things like this gave her the awareness to know what to look for. And she saw the red flags and she was able to then connect me with organizations that could then hold their hands out and get me connected to a mentor and get me stability, you know, and um, housing and, you know, all the different things that we need to be able to get on our feet. So, um, and now Kim is just such an important part. I mean, I just called her the other day cause I've got a, a beautiful young girl that, uh, um, and you're going to, you'll understand this when I say this, Kim, she, when she came to see us first, she didn't even realize she was being trafficked. Yeah. Um, and I know that sounds so weird for anybody watching this right now, because you think, how do you don't know that that's the brainwashing. This is why on, on top of this, I feel the need that we need to create another home down here. She'll understand what I'm saying for as many homes as we have, 
there is still so many girls and boys that still have nowhere to go. My part of my next dream and a part of the vision is, is that I want to create a two-year restoration home that we bring them in. We're going to be trauma-informed, and Kim knows what I'm talking about with that. It's very vital. I want there to be, uh, we're going to have one-on-one -on -one therapy. We're going to have group therapy. We're going to have AA therapy. We're going to have animal therapy. We want to have garden therapy. I mean, we want to have so much surrounding these girls that they just feel so loved and so safe. Like they finally find a place that they belong. And then the next thing we want to do is to help them find their value and their purpose, that they have more value than what, what the world has put on them. And that we help them find their value and their purpose through maybe helping them find a job and get education. And, um, you know, I just call it that we want to help prepare them for their purpose. And so that's what we're in the middle of doing right now. And Kim, I, I can call her up on the phone and go, Kim, I've got a girl I need you to come talk to. And how powerful is it to have somebody who has been through it? It's one thing for me to say, oh, you can make it, you can make it. But it's another thing for them to look at somebody who has made it and on the other side. And she's not telling you she just got married and God is just pouring blessings out on her. And uh, it's such, it's just, she's such a living example of the hope of Christ. And uh, I, I just love her dearly. Kim, will be praying for you and for Carolyn amongst everyone else to make sure that you can continue that important work. And I'm sure we'll talk to you again with all these updates that you guys have gotten the building and you're doing some amazing uh, restoration. So I'm sure we'll talk to you again. Thank you so much. I'll You're call welcome. you later. You're okay. best. Thank you. We turn now to an important situation going on in the world, and that is, of course, the war going on in Ukraine, the invasion going on in Ukraine. And to that end, we wanted to bring on someone who knows a lot more about the situation than we do, because certainly we have all been concerned about it and talking about it. So we want to have the most accurate information to give to all of you. Please welcome uh, Alex Orshkevich. Thank you so much for joining us. Alex is actually the husband of a grade school friend. I'm so appreciative that I could track him down, but he's also the son of a Ukrainian uh, immigrant and a Ukrainian American, as well as a member of the Ukrainian American Community Foundation. Um, so he's exceptionally well qualified to talk to us today. And let's start in with the history of this conflict and how have we gotten to this moment in time? Uh, Ukraine has uh, centuries worth of history uh, that we could go through. Uh, but for the purposes of today, I think it's important to start in the year 2013 when Ukraine was very close to a formalizing a relationship with Europe. Uh, and the president at the time uh, decided not to sign the document. And essentially that uh, led to uh, the protests and, and riots um, in, in the capital and across the country. And Russia responded very aggressively and violently to those peaceful protests. Um, many ended uh, dead and injured. It led to the illegal annexation of Crimea, and then the war in the Donbass, in the Luhansk and Donetsk oblast, or regions in eastern Ukraine. So that brings us up very quickly to today. I'm not doing it justice, but that's it. Uh, so Ukraine has been at war for eight years, um, and that's the sad truth. Uh, most people maybe lost track or weren't paying attention but there were soldiers dug up in their trenches just trying to keep the territory, um, uh, keep the territory that they have before any more is taken. Um, we're, we're dealing with a unjustified, unprovoked war against a peaceful nation. Uh, there was nothing that happened that caused this other than uh, someone's desire for control. Uh, control over a nation that has had its independence formally or officially for 30 years since 1991. Um, and we're talking about the Soviet Union. Vladimir Putin uh, called it a mistake uh, recently that the Soviet Union fell, fell in the first place. 
Gotcha. So what we're drawing from that, what analysts, what you, members of the Ukrainian community in the U.S. are saying is, this is very frightening. And that could mean larger implications beyond Ukraine. And that is why I think we're seeing a much larger, wider response globally. The sad part about this war is there are many Russian soldiers that don't know where they're going. They've been told that they are mm. liberating parts of Ukraine. So there's uh, definitely some disinformation and we're seeing evidence of that. Um, so without further ado, yeah, that, that's kind of a quick summary uh, to bring us to where we are. There's a whole lot more, I'm sure. I wanted to talk to you about the reality of the situation. Like I, I know when we lived in the Middle East, um, what people would hear uh, in America as opposed to what was the reality in Israel was very different. And my sister's Ukra sister-in-law is Ukrainian. And I was talking to her about something last week and she said, Jenny, you of all people should know that what you hear on the news is not really what's happening on the ground. And so, you know, I just want to bring to your attention two things that I've read. One that was sent to me through a very um, a notable pastor that I thought was interesting. So there's two I want to read to you because I thought this was kind of weird. But someone said Ukraine's sovereignty ended in 2014 when the U.S. overthrew it uh, through its democracy. Oh, a democratically, uh, sorry, elected leader in an illegal coup and installed a puppet government. At least 13,000 people have died in fighting since then, a war fueled by U.S. weapons and neo-Nazi militia. And you now my sister-in-law says there is absolutely zero truth to that, but that is being circulated right now on the internet. I would agree with your sister-in-law, 100%. It's all baloney. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is okay. this is uh, a playbook. Uh, this is from the Soviet playbook that... Yeah pits the uh, US against Russia, us versus them type of thing. Russia expected this, or at least what we understand from our intelligence is Russia expected this to be over very quickly. Yeah. Now, if this was truly a, a US installed and fully supported operation as it's being uh, manufactured uh, by our neighbor, um, you know, there wouldn't be a Ukraine right now. You wouldn't have this war of so much resiliency and stories of survival. So that's uh, my answer to your first question. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to read this one last thing to you is that a pastor over there shared, you maybe some of you saw this on their internet as well. Tell the people because of their prayers, God fights our battles. The rockets disappear in the air without reaching our homes and no one knows where they've gone. The enemy tanks run out of fuel. Russian troops get lost and ask our locals for food and for directions. That is definitely God because we are dealing with a, the second strongest army in the world. This morning, Kiev and the other major cities are still free. And we in is it Lviv, L-V-I-V, -V, did not have to run into our basins. Thank you for your prayers. Would you say that that's the stories you're hearing? Are you hearing of miracles happening over there protecting uh, the people? I would have no doubt that things like that are happening. Um, and the reason why I say that and I support what you say uh, is that Ukraine is a very faithful nation and that is reflected in the immigrants that have come over to the US. Uh, multiple waves of immigrants starting in, in the 1800s, mid, mid 1800s, and my father and his family being one of them. And my father and his family were born in Western Ukraine, a very small village outside of Lviv. I was mentioned earlier today. Um, and they were being occupied by the Red Army. Um, and my grandfather, who was an educator and cartographer, he built, creates maps or created maps. Uh, they received a letter one morning and they said, okay, tomorrow at 0600 show up here. And it was just some space uh, in, the, in the middle of the woods. They decided as a family that they were not gonna go to this required, you know, they're being demanded to arrive here or, you know, risk being killed. They decided not to go there um, and they escaped early morning before that time, time frame and they started making their way west. And not too long after 0600, they heard gunshots go off. So we don't know who, we don't know what, but it was very clear that they were intending to murder my grandfather as an intellectual because that's what was what, what they were doing. They were eliminating anyone who was a leader, an educator, a musician, um, and so forth. So uh, fast forward, um, they spent four years in the displaced persons camp. 
uh, in what was Czechoslovakia made their way across Germany. And finally, um, after four or five years post-World War II, they finally made it to the U.S. And here I am today. It seems to be becoming more clear over the last few days, you know, uh, what Putin's up to. But can you maybe just tell us what you think his goal is and why? I think his goal is to revive the Soviet Union. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't think this is limited to Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, I think he wants to disrupt the world order. He's doing it, but I think he's hitting some serious roadblocks, some that may change how his own people see him. And that is a huge key. And for the first time in my lifetime, uh, you actually have Russians standing up and protesting near the Kremlin, which takes a lot of courage. You get arrested for protesting. Hmm. So I, I give a lot of credit to those that were marching, protesting over the weekend uh, near the Kremlin. I mean, we're talking thousands, not like a few hundred people. Um, the media was covering it. So there's definitely video to show that, that people are seeing and hearing there's this war going on and it's not good. And the justification for it is terrible. Putin told his people that there was genocide occurring. And, you know, we're sending soldiers to liberate Russians living in Ukraine. I get it. This is awful. And this is a, an extreme disinformation uh, that I've never, you know, I just, I feel bad for those that are sort of enclosed in that bubble. They don't hear anything else. So one thing we've talked about on this show is how proximity creates empathy. So a lot of us are seeing images of Ukrainian families taking shelter in subways. I know for me close to home, I've seen African students at the borders of Ukraine and even Poland who aren't allowed to get in. Uh, but I just wonder if you could give us some insight beyond the pictures and these headlines. Um, give us a picture of the country and the spirit of its people. Where does that spirit come from? I think the spirit of the Ukrainian people today is rooted in the culture and history that they have lived through, their parents have lived through, and their grandparents. Um, and I think another, another important thing to point out is with independence being in 1991, although some would argue we're not fully independent, as you can see, we are still being haunted mm. uh, today. Um, is that there's a good percentage of the population today that does know or does have a taste of freedom. So you have a, a significant percentage of the population, young people who know what that's like and they like it and they wanna have it, they wanna keep it. They don't wanna be oppressed by a neighbor. Um, they don't want someone saying, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna come in and we're going to, from what we know, they want to replace the president and put in a puppet government. And we're seeing clear evidence of, of that, that the country doesn't want that. And they're putting up a fierce fight as a result. What a united and resilient people. I mean, I, I'm hard to press to think that in America we would all band together unless it was a really, really dire situation. We, we remain very siloed in our independence. So I, I really, truly is a testament to the Ukrainian people that they have they have put so much into this effort, and I agree with you. I think he's surprised at how hard it has been. Um, and so I think that's a real good thing that he's so surprised. Um, but I did want to ask how we can help, you know, in these situations. How can we help? Um, I know people will always want to do that. So tell us how we can help. You mentioned in the refugees that most assuredly are going to be coming out of the nation seeking some shelter. So contacting your representatives, not just state, but your federal um, for example, uh, as a community, uh, in my current city, we uh, had a sit down with our congressman. Donations, of course, um, are tremendous right now. And nothing is more important now uh, than efficiency and speed. It, fellow Ukrainian American, um, similar situation as I, he was born here, but uh, CEO of his own company. He's very, he's made, uh, you know, living that American dream after. Uh, his family immigrated to the U.S., but uh, he, he felt called to put together a number of resources, and it includes uh, whether it's writing, specifically calling your representatives, which organizations you can donate to, and of course, prayer. Um, as a faithful nation, um, 
prayer is certainly uh, important as well. So uh, again, without uh, favoring one or the, or the other, there are many organizations right now that are collecting humanitarian aid. That was my last point. Uh, there's a list of products and items that can be shipped legally uh, from the U.S. to uh, humanitarian aid groups, uh, whether it's Ukraine or neighbors that have stepped up and are willing to receive that humanitarian aid. Thank you for being with us, Alex, just to give us at least a little bit, uh, you know, but if please, and if anyone can help in any way that they can, um, please, uh, we will put all of those resources up for you so that you can um, provide as much help as we can in this situation. So Alex, thank you again. And, um, and we will, we will continue to pray. In fact, we're, that's how we're going to close the show today. We're going to do a prayer for Ukraine to close the show today. Dear Lord, we come, uh, the five of us here come together before you, and we just know that, um, as Alex just mentioned in the story, that there is, there is definitely divine providence that can work in people's lives, that can really, as Jenny mentioned in her story, you know, stop rockets in the air. Um, that could even, you know, instill this spirit that we're seeing in the Ukrainian people and the prayers around the world from, from supporters. And so we ask that that spirit continue to just um, just burn through it, you know, burn in people's hearts and just keep um, in, in, and keep stopping the, and surprising um, this, this dictator who wants to hurt people. And we pray for this sovereign and faithful nation um, that they, in their faith, will remain sovereign and, and uh, you will show them favor for that faith as well. Lord, this should truly bring us into a place of world unity that we unify mm -hmm. in prayer, that the Christians rise up and agree together, that we don't think that it's just something going on somewhere distant that we forget about because we, we don't see it, but that we truly begin to pray with um, uh, passion for these people and for the protection. And Lord, we just speak against the demonic forces that are controlling the minds of the leadership of Russia and other countries that are trying to take advantage of, um, of this situation now in Yeshua's name we pray. You know, I just, uh, there's a scripture and I just wanna pray it out. It's uh, Second Chronicles 14, 11. And it said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord, our God, for we rely on you. And in Come. your name, we have come against this vast army Lord, you are our God and do not let the mortals prevail against you. And Father, I thank you that we can take the word of God and we can stand on it, Lord. And we just join our faith with the, the Ukrainians. And God, I even right now, I even pray for the people in Russia who, God, this is not what they want. Lord, I'm telling you, I am praying that we come in one mind, in one accord yes, to pray against this. And I love what she said, because God, I remember hearing stories of this in Israel, of how people yes. would shoot things and it would just go away. Lord, we're just asking, Lord, that you do what only you can do, Father, yes. because we rely on you, just like this word said. And God, we are expecting a miracle, Lord. Thank you. We rely on you. And you are more than enough, Father. Yes. So give them peace. Give them protection. God, I ask that you give them faith. God, just wipe away the fear that they can stand in the presence and the peace and even the joy that only comes from you, Father, right now in Jesus' name. As we gather, not just around this virtual table, but as we gather in our hearts, that you may unite us together as one in you. We thank you for just the call you've placed on all of us, with the call you've placed on the people of Ukraine who have known and walked with you for centuries, um, much longer than even our own nation has been a country, Lord. So we thank you for that faithfulness of generations. Lord, we pray right now that we as a community of Christians can continue to lift up the situation to you. Father God, we thank you so much that where there's brokenness, you call us to partner with the spirit in each other to bring healing. We thank you that where there's injustice, you call us to partner with the spirit in each other to be just as you are just. And where there is war, Lord, you call us to be peacemakers. So while the world shows us darkness and destruction, we thank you that 
that you are alive, that your spirit is alive, that your people are alive and they're living for you. So give them just strength, give them more faithfulness, pour more of yourself into them and let that be pouring out of them into one another, Lord. I pray that they may hear you um, in this difficult time and I know that you hear them. So Lord, guide and protect them and just bring peace to the situation. In your holy and precious name we pray. Uh, I pray for the children uh, mm -hmm. and the mothers and the fathers. Uh, fathers that are between the ages of 18 and 60 cannot leave Ukraine. They're being asked to fight. Some are coming from other countries and going into fight. So I pray for them, pray for the mothers and their children who are leaving the country and fleeing to safety and that they find a warm and safe place to harbor themselves for now and ultimately find uh, that new chapter in their life. So I, I pray for them. Yes, Lord. Yes. Amen. 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 Well, we send our fervent prayers and support to the country of Ukraine, and we ask you to do so as well. Um, of course, we'll be back for more conversations, but until then, um, we hope that you experience the fullness of, of God in your life and that, like we're talking about with Ukraine, go out and give that fullness to other people in your lives. We'll see you next time.